on your radio, on Global Player and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, the US president says America must keep accelerating its progress on climate change. Two days of talks between world leaders at COP26 is drawing to a close, but the summit will continue for another 10 days. Joe Biden says the president of China made a big mistake in not coming to Glasgow. How do you do that and claim to be able to have any leadership mantle? The same with Putin and Russia. His tundra is burning. He's in a circum... Literally, the tundra is burning. He has serious, serious climate problems. And uh, he is a uh, mum on the willingness to do anything. A mother has urged the Metropolitan Police to get the rot out after two officers shared photos of her murdered daughter's bodies. PC Dennis Jaffa and PC Jamie Lewis were supposed to be guarding the scene when Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman were found in Wembley last year. They'll be sentenced next month. Investigators think the wheels of a train slipped on wet rails, leading to a crash with another one in Salisbury on Sunday. The driver did hit the brakes, but the carriages didn't stop. The LBC markets report in the city the FTSE 100 has closed down 13 points at 72.74. The pound buys $1.36 and one euro 17. LBC weather heavy showers in northern and western areas tonight. Dry and chilly elsewhere, a low of one degree. From Global's Newsroom for LBC, I'm Lucinda Horsley. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation, Cross Question, with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. It's two minutes past eight on LBC. I'm Ian Dale. This is Tuesday's edition of Cross Question. Joining me in the studio are Tim Stanley, the columnist for The Daily Telegraph, Ash Sarkar, contributing editor to Navarra Media, and she tells me their royal correspondent, who'd have thought. Uh, Stephen Timms is chair of the DWP Select Committee and Labour MP for East Ham. And Kevin Chinquin is Conservative member of the House of Lords. They are, of course, here to answer your questions on anything you like. Doesn't have to be cop related but quite happy to take questions on COP. Of course, it's 0345 6060 973. That's the number you need to ask a question. And you can, of course, watch us on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk, on Global Player, on the LBC YouTube and Facebook channels as well. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. <laughs> Paul has just texted to say every time Boris Johnson speaks, it leaves me wanting to see a film. Not quite sure which film you'd want to see after hearing Boris Johnson speak, but there we go. Uh, the first question comes from Ben in Clacton. Hello, Ben. Hello, Ian. Hi, My question like to, to the panel is, President Biden mentioned tonight that Russia and China are disappointed they didn't turn up at the conference. What do the panel think the effect of Russia and China not getting involved in the conference will have on the world's climate? I think we should point out that when we talk about a no-show, it's just the leaders that are no-shows. There are delegations from all of these countries there. Tim Stanley. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, it is disappointing because it suggests there isn't the political support for whatever COP comes up with. But I don't think one should write off what COP has done, uh, which is to set a sense of targets and to begin to establish the systems of a cooperation to get there. It's a, these first, last two days look pretty positive, and I think just because uh, two very, very important, highly polluting economies are not represented by their leaders, I don't think we should write off the achievements of the last two days or the next two weeks. Because they have signed up to a lot of the agreements that have been made, haven't they, despite yeah. the leaders not being there? Yeah, and even if they don't move, this is an important point, that even if some of the agreements from the biggest polluters are not about net zero by 2050 exactly, the point is they're pointing in the right direction and the technology will begin to catch up. And the point will, will be reached whereby some of these economies just go green, partly because they've already started to go green, but because also that's where the technology and the economy is headed. So I, I don't think you should write off this whole process just because of what is undeniably a political disappointment. Ash Sarkar. 
I'd say it's one thing to turn up and make big new splashy pledges and it's another thing to keep to those pledges. So one of the things that we saw yesterday going into COP was the president of Barbados excoriate some of the richer nations for failing to keep up with their climate financing promises. So there was a missing 20 billion from 100 billion promised to vulnerable and poorer nations to help them in mitigation and adaptation. So I think that yes, it is a worrying sign that the leaders of Russia and China, Putin and Xi Jinping respectively, um, have not uh, showed up. I think that does show, as Tim said, uh, perhaps they feel politically vulnerable in making some of these uh, pledges personally. But what I would be on the lookout for is, okay, well, everyone's turned up. They've made these big promises. How are we going to make sure they keep them going forward? Kevin. Thank you. Um, I, I'm really encouraged um, by the way that the PM has shown leadership in securing a commitment to end deforestation by 2030. Um, not only from uh, Brazil's Bolsonaro uh, and from Biden, but from no show Xi Jinping. Um, and I, I'm really encouraged by that. And all, all credit to the PM for securing that commitment. And you, you've been quite critical of him on other issues in the past, haven't you? I'm not critical of the PM personally, but critical of government, yes. But more of that <laughs> a bit later. I'm sure I'm, we may well have more of that a bit later. Well, what do you make of the fact that um, that Prime Minister Modi showed up from India? Because he, he was rumoured to be going to be a no-show, but he seems to have been quite critical in the first couple of days. I think that's encouraging, but I'd echo Ash's point, um, particularly with regards to the fact that India are going to be 20 years behind uh, others uh, in terms of uh, the key commitments, um, particularly, I think, net zero. Mm. So they that's have, worrying. They have, they have committed to 50% renewables by 2030, which I'm not sure anybody was expecting, so... And the Indians are remarkable innovators. Um, uh, so um, if, yeah, they, they have a potential to do something really exciting on that. Stephen Timms. Well, I think it's disappointing that uh, Russia and China are not represented by their leaders, but I, I certainly wouldn't say we should write the whole thing off for that reason. I think we have to wait and see where they, they get to. There have been some worthwhile agreements already, but we do have to get a lot more out of this, I think, um, if we are to feel pleased with the outcome. And, and let's see what happens over the next 10 days. Because Ed Miliband, Labour's Shadow Business Secretary, of course, he, he was very involved in the previous COP. Um, he, I thought, was remarkably um, positive in some of the remarks that he's made, particularly about India. Because I was when I first heard about this, I, was, I think it was on the BBC, it was a quite negative report saying, oh, well, they've only said 2070. But Ed Miliband actually pointed out, well, that is actually quite something for India to make any commitment like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Ed is, uh, has had a lot of experience of these matters. And, uh, yeah, I, let's let's see where they, they reach over the, the 10 days ahead. I, I must say, I haven't had much of a sense that we've got a plan for where this should all end up by the end of the next 10 days. I hope that we do, but let's wait and see. Well, just on that, um, we've got a text from Scott in West London. He says, how confident are the panel that any COP26 agreements reached will be kept, given that politicians and governments come and go, and also the issue that these agreements aren't legally binding? That is an interesting point, isn't it? Because this agreement on methane today, mm. which on the face of it seems quite significant, Ash, but it's a voluntary agreement. Well, I think one of the things to bear in mind is that pretty much every model shows that pursuing decarbonisation is in fact cheaper than trying mitigation and adaptation down the line. The reality is that we're going to have to do a combination of both, but the fact is that pursuing these solutions now is much cheaper. So there is an incentive for countries to get on net zero as quickly as possible. Even India, which has chosen a relatively late date for net zero 2070, they do have an incentive because there are some models which suggest that over half of Indians will be living under temperatures too hot for human habitation by that point. So there are other pressures on these governments. The other thing is looking at the economics of some of this technology. Solar, hydro, these things are only going to get cheaper. Whereas the same isn't true of fossil fuels. I think there is also a role for nuclear, but unlike these other technologies, nuclear doesn't seem to just get cheaper and cheaper. So I think that there are some incentives here. It might have to be uh, backed up with putting climate at the heart of trade negotiations, perhaps even having sanctions for, you know, 
bad faith climate vandals who are out there. Um, but I think that it's something to be positive about rather than defeatist. Um, Stephen, from a governmental point of view, you've been a minister. How, how, how do... How do you make sure that, that countries do keep to the pledges that they're making at these types of conferences? Well, mechanisms like this are the only thing we've got. We have to make use of these arrangements. And, you know, I think if you look back over the history of these things, actually, they have delivered. Um, they have been effective in bringing about major changes of the kind that we are going to need a great deal more of over the next few years. So I, I'd be hopeful that this mechanism can deliver and that people will stick to the, the commitments that they've made. And on the whole, I think the track record there has, has been not too bad. Tim? I agree with Ash. It's about setting a direction and once the... I feel I'm achieving an awful lot. Where are you well, agree? The topic, Ian. <laughs> there is only, at any given time, there's only about 5% of the population that isn't on board with this stuff. Um, the extraordinary thing is is how vocal and how much attention they gain in the mainstream media. But actually, there is an overwhelming, not just national consensus, but global consensus, including with countries that ordinarily are bad faith actors like China. And now, one should bear in mind, I would add, and I understand where, this, where the skeptics are coming from, this year, China is aiming to produce more coal than ever before in its history, and China produces more coal than the rest of the world combined. So we do have to be realistic about that. Plus, we have to bear in mind that with China, it's not just about the environment, it's about other strategic objectives. Um, such as uh, its cyber war, uh, its aggression towards Taiwan, and of course the oppression of its own people. Uh, so you're dealing with a country that you fundamentally can't trust. So I understand on both scores why there is skepticism. But to echo what Ash has said, once the global economy is going in a certain direction, there will be economic momentum mm -hmm. to follow it all the way. So even if India's goals are only uh, half what one would have hoped uh, later than one would have wished for, the point is that by aiming that way, it will get quicker as it gets cheaper. I mean, can I jump in there? Because you're completely right. China is the world's biggest polluter at the moment. But when it comes to cumulative carbon emissions, atmospheric carbon, the US is still by far and away in the lead. So you I do think historical. historically. So one of the things that we do need to bear in mind is that rich countries, which developed because we got on the fossil fuel train first, we do have um, special obligations, I think. Um, the second thing about China is, again, you're right, uh, they are you know, producing and burning more coal than any other country. But the other thing that they're uniquely positioned to do and have done is wipe out underwriting uh, coal financing abroad right, for, for other countries. It's one of the things that the Chinese government has done. Second thing is looking at the domestic solar capacity of China. It's bigger than Europe and America combined. So yes, big, dirty polluter, bad faith actor. I think Russia in terms of its um, intention to keep on exporting fossil fuels is another big problem. But you should also look at where China and other countries in the region as well, Vietnam solar capacity is bigger than France, Germany and Italy combined, uh, where perhaps they are making progress at a faster rate than uh, richer countries and Western nations as well. Kevin, can I ask you um, about something different that happened at the COP26 conference today when an uh, Israeli minister turned up in a wheelchair and wasn't allowed to go into the conference centre, which, I mean, we don't know the circumstances, but on the face of it, it seems a, an outrageous thing to have happened. I think the Prime Minister has apologised for it happening. Um, you're a wheelchair user yourself. Do, do you ever experience this yourself? Do you think it is a, a, a common thing? We're going to be talking about it after nine o'clock on the phone in. Sure. Uh, I experienced it ten minutes ago, trying to get into this building, because the lift up to the uh, front entrance is out of order. And I had to climb out of my chair. We should explain we're at Four Millbank in Westminster, not, not, at not at LBC Towers. Not at LBC Towers. So... And, and no reasonable adjustment had been put in place. So I think the key issue here, quite apart from it being outrageous, as you say, but what really saddened me was to hear uh, a minister uh, earlier on, and all credit to the PM for, for apologising, but uh, a British minister saying, oh, it was the Israelis' fault, they obviously hadn't alerted the organisers. Actually, the Israelis had, but you're right, and you're right to do so, because the law imposes or has a requirement that the duty to make reasonable adjustments, whether it's an induction loop for hearing impairment, braille, large print menus for visual impairments, 
or indeed a ramp for wheelchair users, that is an anticipatory duty. The onus is not on the service user, mm. it's on the service provider. And I know that because I was appointed by William Hague when he introduced the Disability Discrimination Act a quarter of a century ago to advise the government on the implementation of the law. I'm really worried that a cabinet minister is not familiar with that fundamental... Who was this cabinet minister? It was George Eustace. I mean, he was probably doing his best in explaining the situation he saw at at the time. So I'm not personally uh, wanting to criticise him. I just think it's a very poor and symptomatic reflection of the government's attitude, inadequate attitude, to disabled people in this country. It is incredible at an international conference like this that one of the first things they would think about was, well, putting a strategy in to cater for people with disabilities, not just people in wheelchairs. I mean, there's lots of other disabilities that we could be talking about here. I mean, this kind of comes under your remit, doesn't it, Stephen, in the select committee? Uh, It does. It absolutely does. Yes, I know it's very hard to understand how that mistake can have been made. I, I mean, I hope it isn't. Uh, symptomatic of a a wider failure of planning. As I I said earlier, I I haven't had much of a sense of a plan of what is going to come out of this uh, uh, summit. But let's hope for for the best. But certainly, disabled access should have been in their right of the start. Indeed, the the venue, it should have been a feature of the venue before the conference was organised. So who knows what's gone wrong there. I know Liberal Democrat conferences have been held in this venue before, right, well, and they're actually very disabled friendly. In terms, cause, but anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to be talking much more about this after nine o'clock, and I particularly want to hear from you if you have experienced this yourself. We just heard of Kevin's experience in the in the, in the last few minutes in this building here. So we'd like to hear from you. How prevalent is this? How widespread is this? Or has it got better since the what was it? The Dis- Disability Discrimination Act 1995, I think it was, that yes. really started this this drive to have more rights for disabled people. Um, So we'll be taking your calls on that after nine. It's 17 minutes past eight. This is LBC.
LBC. Ash and Tim comparing their respective books. Ash is writing hers. Tim has just published his. It's called Whatever Happened to Tradition. In 30 seconds, Tim, whatever did happen to tradition? <laughs> <laughs> it's not gone away, but we need it back. Uh, <laughs> tradition is good for us. It's not anti-change, but it helps us to navigate change. And my argument is that it, it is a slender handrail as we go through life, something to cling on to so that we can, we can adapt and change and grow, but re retain a sense of who we are. Appealing to all Daily Telegraph readers. Oh, and beyond the mail, the spectator. <laughs> But also, the, media. there's a bit of Karl Marx in there as well. There, I, it speaks to the left as well, and I really do want left-wing people to read it because I talk a lot about the traditions of the socialist movement and of the left and why they're important to them as well. And your book isn't out for a year or two yet? No, and it's still very much a work in progress, but it's called Minority Rule. It is about culture war and how it came to be and where it's going, and it'll be out with Bloomsbury at some point once I can stop hating myself and finish the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling very, very well. Kevin and Stephen, you haven't got books to plug, have no. you? No. no. Right, let's move on to another question. 0345 6060 973, if you'd like to uh, join us and ask our panel a question. James is in Watford. Hi, James. Uh, good evening. Um, is the council culture situation getting out of hand? Short question. I guess this is going to be addressed in your book, Ash, so I think I'll come to you first. I think it's really important for us to define what cancel culture is because it can sometimes be used in a really loose way. So how I tend to think about it is when institutions or groups react to public outcry by sanctioning or firing somebody. And I think that's really important to nail down because then I think it tells us a bit about, well, what is it that we expect of institutions? How has that changed? I think that things like the Me Too movement and BLM and also just changing social attitudes more generally have changed what we expect of institutions. We expect them to uh, take action against people, whether or not they have said something or done something outside of their professional life. And I think sometimes that can be really dangerous. It is, I think, dangerous to think about the role employers should play in curtailing somebody's lawful free expression. That's not to say that if, you know, somebody's been filmed using slurs down at the pub, that maybe they should stay in their role as a teacher, right? So I think that this is a blurry line, and it's one which we need to negotiate together rather than coming down on a harsh yes or no. And the trouble is, we'll all have different lines that we draw, won't we? Absolutely, and that's why I really don't like the way in which this conversation and sometimes the way I've participated in it has been very much about establishing absolutes. Uh, the fact is is that all of us have some arbitrary line about what we think is acceptable and what we think is beyond the pale. The task of a democracy is to get together and, and decide what it is. The last thing that I would like to add is that I think sometimes cancel culture gets misused as a term, usually by people in our position, people who are pundits or have a platform or politicians, and they use the, frame, the phrase cancel culture to refer to them experiencing a high volume of criticism. Now, that's not being cancelled. That's the marketplace of ideas. And if you don't like it, you can always go home. Um, and so I think those are important things to distinguish. Don't go home before nine. <laughs> Kevin. Um, I think there's a danger. I, I associate cancel culture partly with identity politics. And I totally agree with um, Ash about the... I think she mentioned dangers of extremism, of, if you like, being really fundamentalist. And I, I think engaging and, and tolerance, obviously, with respect as well, uh, and n not doing things that, um, for example, you know, whether it's incitement to racial hatred or other types of hatred. But my fear is, with regards to politicians, is that when politicians, particularly on my side of, of Parliament, talk about identity politics and they, they tend to then equate it with something they don't like, such as equality or equality of opportunity, which I'm passionate about, and use it as a feeble fig leaf for doing nothing. And I think that's, um, that's really dangerous because I think it's part of why we seem to have gone backwards in many cases on, for example, disability. Ash, you were cancelled last week, weren't you? Or Navarra Media was on YouTube. Your, your YouTube channel disappeared. We did, and I think this is also... Why I was bereft. I mean, those two hours were the worst of your life, Ian. <laughs> um, and I tell you, they're worrying for me, but this is why I think that collapsing everything into cancel culture is unhelpful, because what happened was that through human error, we talked to some of the YouTube execs, and they told us that it was uh, human error. Our channel got wrongly flagged as a spam scam or economic deception, uh, and then our channel got entirely nuked. It got taken off. 
off. Now, neither of those things should have happened. They restored the channel. They were very apologetic. The reason why I think it's wrong to think about this as cancel culture is because it doesn't seem to have emerged uh, in relation to any outcry. All your letters of complaint did nothing. Um, well, I did tweet my hey. support for you. Well, it was, and it was, we actually did really appreciate the support which came from, from all sides of, of politics. What this speaks to is that I think that the development of social media and the emergence of these huge tech giants of, you know, Google who own YouTube, Facebook who obviously own Instagram and uh, WhatsApp as well, um, and Twitter, is that the work of journalism regulated journalism. We're regulated by Impress, obviously lots of other channels on YouTube are regulated by Ofcom or Ipso as well. Regulated journalism is now at the mercy of these unaccountable mm. tech giants where the internal governance is like a black box. We don't know what goes on inside. And that's a very vulnerable place, I think, for a democracy to be in. Uh, let's just remind you of James's question, is the cancel culture movement getting out of hand? Stephen. Well, I, I think I broadly agree with Ash's and Kevin's points. And what, what I'd like to see is the public discourse being a bit more generous and a bit more rancorous, a bit less rancorous, <laughs> say. a bit less rancorous than it is at the moment. And, you know, I think it's, it's the rancor which kind of sometimes gets into uh, to, to, to cancel culture. And I, uh, somehow I think we have to find ways of being a bit more respectful to one another and being prepared to listen to points of view that are different to ours and engaging you know, in a sort of courteous way, civil way, um, rather than reacting with the anger which, which sometimes characterises particularly uh, the discourse on, on social media. And if we could find a way of doing that, then I think we'd, we'd, we'd move beyond cancel culture. How we do it, I don't know. I'm talking to some people over the weekend about this, but uh, I think we have to find it. Tim? Uh, if I can try to define what makes cancel culture different, but also very, very old, is that, it, it, is that when someone says something that people disagree with, they don't just try to censor that one opinion. They attempt to actually destroy the career and the reputation of the person who said it. Mm. That's why cancel culture is a bit different from regular censorship. And in fact, cancel culture usually has nothing to do with state censorship. Sometimes the things that are said which one, for which one are cancelled are perfectly legal. The interesting thing is either the application of pressure through activism or creating an atmosphere so poisonous that that person has to retreat from the public sphere after what they've said. Now, some things that people are cancelled for which muddies this They've said something which is actually totally socially unacceptable, and it could even be that it deserves to have some kind of consequence. But the problem is, is that uh, it has become such a, a commonplace tool that now people are saying things and they're being cancelled, and the consequences is it, it shuts down areas of debate so that people feel, I daren't go into this area. It's not just I'm, I, I'll be careful about what I say, but I literally won't raise a subject for fear, not only that I'll be censored, but that my entire livelihood will be destroyed. So a, a recent example is Kathleen Stock, uh, the professor at Sussex who is accused of being anti-trans. She'd say she isn't, but she's written about trans issues in a way that upsets a body of activists. And she has resigned. Now, her institution, her university actually backed her. Loads of government ministers backed her. Many members of the public backed her. But for whatever reason, that such was the atmosphere at work that she felt she couldn't continue with her job. So it wasn't just that her opinion was corrected, but she herself was shut down. And just to add on a personal note, I work in the media. It is my job to say things and to be controversial. But I can tell you that for the last few years, I have heavily self-censored. Yeah, me too. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Some of the self-censoring actually has probably been a good thing because I've been less quick to be mean or cruel or to say things that are just simply <laughs> inaccurate. But there's a lot of issues which I won't touch and I won't go near because I'm not just worried about someone saying, you're wrong. I'm worried about literally losing my mortgage. So I, I, it does have a chilling effect upon public discourse. Do you have that at all? Because, I mean, I, I, I absolutely sympathise with what Tim has said, and particularly I think it is different when you're on broadcast media than maybe written media, mm. uh, although written media, I suppose, is more permanent in a, in a way. But there are subjects that I think about wh whether I really should be talking about them on, on the radio, which I wouldn't have done five years ago. I mean, it's interesting you say that because... 
the time when I experienced it most acutely was when I first started lecturing and I had to give a few seminars about terrorism. And I wanted to teach a very uh, critical, uh, non-dogmatic approach where you questioned rigorously what the category of the terrorist was and how this, you know, historically came to be. And I felt so aware of being a Muslim in that academic institution, I was genuinely worried about putting a foot wrong, phrasing something badly and being referred to prevent, you know, the the government's counter extremism Mm. channel. So for me, that was where I experienced it most acutely, which is much more in line with, you know, what Tim was talking about in terms of, you know, the formal state censorship angle. In terms of this more informal, uh, you know, kind of climate of, you know, hostility or rancor or, or anger in a debate, of, of course I find myself in that all the time. I mean, I spend too much time on Twitter, I'm probably, you know, listening to too much anger for my own good. The one thing that I would say but you is provoke that- anger, don't you, uh, unintentionally? I mean, just by me saying that you're coming on the programme tonight, I saw some of the tweets that you got as a result of that. Yeah, and I kind of think, well, that's Twitter, there are loads of angry people, and the beauty of getting in a room with with, with human beings and actually talking face-to-face is that you can have a much better Mm. and enlightening conversation. So I try not to take that stuff too seriously. The thing I would say is that what cancel culture has also evolved into is it allowed people to present themselves as being silenced on some of the biggest platforms and stages our public sphere has to offer and I think that that is one of the things which is added to a lot of the anger within within you know certain certain instances like for instance with Kathleen Stark I've spoken to some of the activists around Sussex University and one of the things that they feel is that there's been absolutely no attempt to understand where they're coming from or what they're saying. Now, this isn't me saying, you know, Kathleen Stock deserved to resign or, you know, someone else was wrong to protest. Well, my point is, is that one person has had consistent access to the media and a whole set of others haven't. And I think that that has added to a lot okay. of the climate of hostility. I, 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 say, I, I agree with that. And I want to make it absolutely clear that what I'm describing here isn't just a problem faced by right wing people. Left-wing people are cancelled, uh, religious minorities are cancelled, mm-hmm. and for decades, trans people were cancelled, who, if they had talked about themselves, would have faced cancellation by a public that was unsympathetic at that time, which is why I think this is about the exercise of power. I don't just think it's about an ideological struggle. I think it's a very old-fashioned human thing. It's Stalinism, it's McCarthyism, it's cancel culture. It's not as materially bad, but it comes from the same instinct to not just disagree, but actually destroy your opponent. Stephen, there's an interesting discussion in Parliament <coughs> about the online safety bill and, you know, whether there are changes that we need to make to deal with some of the really vicious, horrible stuff on Twitter and, and some other places on online. And particularly, I think, a discussion about whether there should be constraints on anonymity on Twitter. That if you say something, whether it's really offensive or, or not, there ought to be some way of finding out who you are um, and, and, and therefore a bit of accountability and you know there are various discussions about that I'm not sure where they're going to end up but I think there is something potentially quite important there that we might be able to change that might just improve things well what an interesting discussion James thank you very much for your question there 0345 6060 Tim Stanley Ash Sarker Stephen Timms and Kevin Shinkwin with me until nine o'clock taking your calls it's 8 33 news headlines with Lucinda Horsley Boris Johnson says the eyes of the world will remain on the COP26 climate change summit for the next 10 days. World leaders are now heading home from Glasgow, but high-level talks will continue between senior delegates. Two police officers have admitted sharing photos on WhatsApp of the bodies of two murdered sisters found in bushes in Wembley in North London. One of their faces was superimposed on one of the images sent. Investigators think a train involved in a crash in Salisbury went past a red signal because it slipped on the rails. The driver did try to brake, but the train didn't stop. LBC weather, heavy showers in northern and western areas tonight, dry and chilly in the south, a low of one degree. This is LBC. This is-
57. Tim Stanley, Ash Sarker, Stephen Tims and Kevin Shinkwin with me answering your calls. 0345 6060973. Uh, text question from Katie in Portsmouth. Why have we all forgotten about this government's cut to the universal credit uplift? So many families are struggling right now. Shouldn't they bring it back and sharpish? Um, Stephen Timms, as chair of the Work and Pension Select Committee, I think it's only right and proper that I should come to you first on this. Well, I absolutely agree. I think it was uh, the wrong thing to do to take it away. My view is that it should have been left permanently. My committee, which is an all-party committee, agreed that it should be left in place at least until next April, until we were properly out of, hopefully, out of the, the pandemic. But, you know, the reality now is that support for unemployed families is the lowest it's been in real terms for 30 years. And in real terms, in the last 30 years, the economy has grown by 50%. Support for unemployed families is no more at all than it was 30 years ago. And if you compare it with uh, average earnings, it's the lowest it's ever been. If you go back to 1911, when unemployment benefit was introduced by Lloyd George, it was set at a level that's higher as a proportion of average earnings than it is today. And I, I, I do think we are at the point now where the level of basic support for families who are out of work is lower than is needed for the system to do its basic job. You see, I, I didn't know what the what you've just said. I didn't know those statistics. And I'm thinking to myself, why isn't Keir Starmer and Jonathan Reynolds, the Labour DWP spokesman, why aren't they banging on about this more than they are? Well, it's John, a bit Jonathan, of an open goal, isn't it? Jonathan Reynolds certainly is. Uh, I've heard him say it frequently. Um, Keir has certainly raised it as well, but of course, Keir's got lots of things to, to raise. But, you know, on a, an all-party basis, my committee called for the... Uh, removal of that uplift not to go ahead when it did. Tim? What the government, I suspect, would say is, first of all, uh, it was a temporary rise. And we know what they would say. What do you okay, say? Okay, well, well, because someone's just... just because, so, that, so that point of view is that it was a temporary rise and also they've reformed the taper, which they say will, will, make, will make up for some of it. For those um, who are in work, it does. Right, partly, OK. Partly, OK, but, partly. but where I think they've, they've made a mistake is that whenever you spend vast sums of money, as the government has done, uh, there's a temptation to try and make clever savings. And there's a history of clever savings, like the pastry tax and... Uh, the 10p and all, and, and all those sort of things that go back in the past. And very often what seems like a wheeze um, as, as, as a way of saving a little bit of money while you're spending so much elsewhere uh, actually comes back to bite you because obviously it has human consequences, but politically it just looks incredibly mean and out of touch. And the reality is, is that we have a very tough winter coming and I, I don't think the government has prepared the public for how tough it's going to be. And I'm not quite sure that the budget reflected how difficult it's going to be. And after that, Come April, you're going to have national insurance rises. I know this is an unemployment, but in general terms, you're going to have national insurance rises. Uh, you're going to have council tax increases. There's going, there really is going to be a cost of living problem, and I'm not sure this was the place necessarily to save a bit of money. Maybe some of the other bigger projects shouldn't have been spent, or some other form of tax rise should have been used instead of going after the unemployed. This is quite an interesting one, isn't it? Because this is not a left-right issue. There are plenty of people on the right who thinks that the, think that this was a really big mistake by the government, Kevin Shinkwin. And I think particularly a big mistake for those who can't work, um, and I'm thinking of um, disabled people who, through no fault of their own, can't work, and count as among the poorest of the poor. And, I'm just going back to the points that have already been made. Um, a, we have a duty to support them. It's going to be a very tough winter. We've got a cost of living uh, crisis, some would say. Um, but the point uh, I would make um, now that the government has rejected an amendment I, I supported in the House of Lords to bring uh, the uplift back is that actually this is politically potentially very expensive. Goes right back to the points that have been made by others. And I'm thinking of Brand Rishi, Brand Rishi Sunat. You know, here is someone from... Which he thinks about that quite a lot too. <laughs> he does, and, and all credit to him. You know, he's done great work on reducing the taper. It's going to benefit people hugely you know, by £500 uh, or more uh, in, in December before Christmas. Four months for reducing uh, the taper, but 
As someone from a very wealthy family, you know, his father in law's a, a, a billionaire, I would hate Brand Rishi to be damaged because he would be seen as one of the richest people ever to have been Chancellor, punishing the poorest for being poor. <coughs> um, Ash Sarkar, look, they're not going to bring it back, are they? I mean, they've had every opportunity to do so, and they will say, well, in the budget, yes, we did take £6 billion away, but we've given £2 billion back through various schemes. That still means a deficit of £4, million, four billion. But politically, that ship has sailed. And I think that one of the reasons they didn't perform the U-turn, which had been rumoured uh, in the lead up to the budget, is because they felt they had the political room to do so. I think they felt that they could get away with uh, not keeping the uplift of 20 quid, which, let's be clear, for many families was the difference between destitution and just about surviving it really made a huge difference to you know families in the area where I live, Tottenham, where it meant that they didn't have to go to the food bank quite so often. It made a real difference to their lives. Um, but there was a lot of, I think, yeah, the warm reception that the budget received within the media, um, I think, was, was a bit undeserved. People were hailing it as more like a Labour budget than a traditionally uh, Conservative one. I think they were falling well, over themselves. Yeah, but all to, my Labour friends said so they thought it was a great budget. And, and, I think, and I think that they were taken in by some of, you know, the surface offers, particularly um, on uh, fuel duty and alcohol duty and some splashing of the cash here. The uh, uh, reduction of the taper for universal credit was something which was really welcome and I think a response to the embarrassing sight of Therese Coffey not seeming to understand that even if you work longer hours for your universal credit, it will take a whole extra day's work for you to make up that 20 quid. Um, but it was really tinkering around the edges. You, know, you had this you know, huge cut from universal credit. You have the uh, national insurance hike, which does affect uh, some of the lowest paid people in this country. And you had some pretty, you know, big areas where you could, you know, tax people who have the broader shoulders and the ability to do so, left alone. You didn't have anything on tax avoidance. There was also no me uh, mention of the climate. And, so, you know, some, you know, once upon a time, solidly Tory policies, like, for instance, uh, equalising income tax and capital gains tax. That was an old Nigel Lawson policy from way back when. Bringing £90 billion over five years. Those are the kinds of ideas which Rishi Sunak seems completely uninterested okay. in. There are fairer ways to save money than taking it out of universal credit. We've got a great question coming up next, which will allow you to display all of your royal correspondence skills. Yes, come on. <laughs> it's 8.45. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. One newspaper says it's 200 plus, another says it's 400 plus. Private jets that have flown into Glasgow for COP26, without any doubt, is the motorcade for President Joe Biden. Presumably he manages to stay awake when he's in the back of his car. It takes 22 vehicles to move the president from the airport to his hotel or to the cop or wherever it might be. And also the leaders and others, they have some collective desire to outdo each other on hyperbole. We get the message solutions might be handy. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. LBC. COVID
wants to know if Ash thinks Antonio Conte is the right man for Spurs, but we don't want to go there, do we? Um, um, you don't want to hear me cry on the radio, do you? <laughs> no. no. Uh, let's go to our next question. It's Richard in Woolwich. Hello, Richard. Hey, good evening, Ian. Uh, Hi. A really thoughtful panel tonight. My question we, is... We have them every night, don't we? You do. You do indeed. That's true. <laughs> My question is, do the panel think that the members of the House of Windsor are good champions and ambassadors for climate change? As a fan of tradition, Tim Stanley. Yes, they absolutely are. I, 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 okay, the, the caution here is the flying around the world in private jets bit, right? That's, that's why people are a bit uncertain. Of but... which there are apparently 400 uh, descended on Glasgow. Oh, I personally find that ridiculous. I'm of the view that people shouldn't have been going there at all. It should have been a virtual conference. That would have struck a real blow for saving the environment. But that aside, um, yes, I, I, think, I think they absolutely are. Uh, the monarchy has a sort of a, a pot of, of moral authority. It's going to be very careful how it spends it. Uh, there's always a slight risk whenever the monarchy gets involved in politics that it overexposes itself. It's like, like the Queen's famous phrase, I have to be seen to be believed, crucially seen but not heard. And there, there's a slight risk that if the monarchy are too associated with a political cause, they can actually damage their own brand because what if that cause proves controversial? What if going green costs the voters a lot of money? They might start to resent the Windsors. Nonetheless, if you think this is a good cause, then you've got pretty much the best ambassadors you can hope for. And I think this, the last few days have absolutely reinforced the case for a monarchy. If this conference had been set in America, who else, in a, as a non-partisan, globally admired figure, could have uh, opened that conference with a degree of authority uh, and reach that they enjoy? Uh, and in this country, we are so lucky to have people like them and to be able to deploy them at the right moment. You've got to deploy it carefully, don't overuse them, although the monarchy has always been political. Queen Victoria campaigned against vivisection. But nonetheless... <laughs> it's true, it's true. That they've always been a little bit political. Got to be careful always, how you do it. I always learn something but it's, <laughs> but they, they, We are so lucky to have them. Imagine if this was Donald Trump's America holding that conference. I, I think that was unlikely. I don't. I mean, if, Donald, <laughs> if Donald Trump had still been president, I suspect he would have joined uh, Xi and Putin in not coming. But well, he would we have said, I love cops. I want one on every street. <laughs> <laughs> Why stop at 26? <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Timms. Well, um... I, I'm sure that uh, we can think of ways in which members of the royal family will have to rethink their lives given the challenges of climate change, as we all will. Um, but I do think probably, and I, I rather agree with Tim about this, I think the royal family do have something to offer. And actually, the, you know, some members of the royal family have definitely got a track record in this area as well. I don't think I realised quite how active the Duke of Edinburgh had been mm. on some of these issues until he died. And, and then we were we were told, all, all about it. So, yeah, I, I think they've got a, a part to play and I, I do think we should use them and, you know, the, the, they, they're clearly willing to be used to spread messages about tackling climate change and we should take them up on that willingness. And now over to our royal correspondent, Ash Sarkar. I think you'll be unsurprised to hear that I think that they're not good ambassadors for the climate. Because while, yes, Prince Charles has this long-standing interest in green issues and environmentalism, you know, he and Camilla have a carbon footprint which is 96 times bigger than the average person simply because of their use of private helicopters and private jets. Uh, the Queen, yes, was able to lend a stamp of moral authority uh, in terms of her statement about the necessity of reaching uh, net zero and taking action on the climate, but the Queen also secretly lobbied Scottish ministers so that uh, she could be the only person in the country who was exempt as a landowner from facilitating the building of pipelines which allow you to uh, heat your home using renewable energy. So I think that what this illustrates is the problem of what I call private jet environmentalism, where you call on these fantastically wealthy and remote figures to lend an aura of celebrity or authority or credibility to the environmental cause. Because what that does is put the question of hypocrisy front and centre. And I think also just Extracts from, I think, a really key point here, which is that we should be asking the fabulously wealthy, the people who take private jets, to change their lifestyles first before we start demanding that ordinary people give up their one holiday a year or, you know, um, don't heat their homes and put on another jumper or something like that. We need to ask the rich and the wealthy to do their bit, give up the private helicopter, take the train like the rest of us, Charlie. I don't know why you're looking at me. I don't have a helicopter. I have, I have been in one once. It was a very frightening experience. <laughs> Kevin. I, I remember one of the first questions we had on tonight's show was about leadership and how important that was to making progress uh, in tackling uh, climate change. And I think that Her Majesty the Queen has led 
from the front, despite not being well, she's given a, uh, a video message uh, where she talked about uh, none of us living forever. But she also spoke with pride about, as we've already heard, Prince of Wales, uh, or rather Duke of Edinburgh, then Prince of Wales, and now the Duke of Cambridge. And I, I think the great thing about the royal family is that they really have passed the baton on this issue down through the generations. All credit to them for doing that. Quick quiz question for you all. Which world leader was the first to make a speech on climate change at the United Nations? Maggie. Yeah. Correct. Margaret Thatcher in 1988. I just said that to wind you up. You you know what? You live and you learn, don't you? (laughs) Don't you? Uh, Right. Thank you very much indeed for that, Richard. Let's go. In fact, let's hear what you think, Richard. Do you think they're good ambassadors? Um, Well, I hope they're not listening. I kind of rather side with Ash on this one. Um, The thing that I think that um, disturbs me is that I I, I learned just this week that over 2 million is paid out on energy costs for the royal estate, for the crown estate. And and I think that needs to be uh, attended to. But it's not the taxpayer that pays for that. It is the crown estate that pays for that. It it is, um, but... I mean, what that it, it, symbolism is very important this week, and I think it, it, we it, we're being asked, and rightly so, to start looking at our own ways of c- consumption. And I think mm. that for me, um, it, it should leadership should start by people also really beginning to um, to, to, to do that as well. And, I, and, I, and I'm, that's I'm a very fair point. Thinking. Okay, Richard, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, we don't have an awful lot of time left, so I'm going to ask for short answers on this one, which is quite a big question, though. Dale is in Ipswich. Hello, Dale. Oh, hi, Ian. Um, Hi, panel. Great show tonight. Um, Hi. My my question is, uh, does there need to be more scrutiny um, on the failed track and trace system, given the high water and amount of cost? Stephen Timms. Yes, I think there should be a a, a public inquiry, uh, the sooner the better, into what's happened. And one part of that will certainly need to to look at the huge sums that have been spent on a pretty ineffective system. It was a privatisation that went very badly wrong, I'm afraid, and we do need to learn lessons from it. Kevin? I totally agree with um, Stephen. I think lessons need to be learnt and there needs to be accountability. I think one of the key developments under COVID is that the state, the government, has become more powerful, and Parliament needs to shift the balance and hold government more to account. Uh, And that should be done by a public inquiry as opposed to a select committee inquiry? Um, I I think, yes, uh, there needs to be a very thorough scrutiny. Tim Stanley. It was a disgraceful waste of money. Uh, there has to be consequences for it, not just an investigation, but uh, people need to be, uh, r- r- people need to pay for this, uh, in effect. Um, and it's important that uh, we don't write off the last 18 months as a wartime situation in which vast sums of money were spent because we were in a panic and it was the only, only thing we could possibly have done. No, it should be accounted for. Uh, there were bad decisions made, bad things done, uh, and we need to learn from those mistakes. Ash. Short answer, yes. Um, I also wouldn't place this as a waste of money, which happened in the past. It's still going on now. You've got uh, consultants who are part of this seemingly now non-existent test and trace system who are being paid sums of £7,000 a day, which is a phenomenal amount of money. That's like my year's rent, nearly. Um, So I think, yes, uh, there needs to be an inquiry. There needs to be accountability. And more than that, we need to learn the lessons from it. You know, you can't... I think just parcel off pandemic management to, you know, your mates in the private sector. You need to make sure that the bodies who are trusted with this vital work are properly are properly qualified and can be held accountable if they fail to do their duty in protecting the public. Dale, thank you very much indeed for that. I think we, we gathered from your question what your views are, so thank you for phoning in. Uh, final text question from Brian in Gloucester. I have to say that in all the months that we've been doing this programme, I think this is the best one so far. Whom amongst you and your panel, it's the you bit that I'm worried about here, is concomitantly shocked by cold bed sheets and invigorated by their chill? Tim Stanley. Oh, I'm more shocked and invigorated if I find someone else is in the bed already. 
No, that is a sensation that I recognize and that I, I look forward to every night. Uh, but, it, it, but one can take the edge off with a hot water bottle placed under the sheets about half an hour in advance. Uh, you live for the day, don't you? <laughs> Stephen Timms. Uh, I'm shocked, but I don't think I'm invigorated. <laughs> uh, and I'd prefer to have warmer sheets if the option is available. Kevin. I hate the warm bedroom. I can't sleep in the warm bedroom, so the idea of cold sheets is, is fine. I'm totally with you. I grew up in a farmhouse where you had ice on the inside of the uh, windows, so I, I rather like cold sheets. Ash? Not only do I like chilly sheets, I think coolest of all is Between the Sheets by the Isley Brothers, one of my favourite songs to play at <laughs> bedtime. Very smooth, very cool, gets you nice and relaxed. Thoroughly recommend it to Brian and Gloucester, who's not listened to it already. Who'd have thought? Thank you very much indeed to all of you. One of my favourite editions of Cross Question, Tim Stanley, Stephen Timms, Ash Sarka and Kevin Shinkwin. We will, of course, be back with another edition of Cross Question at 8 o'clock tomorrow. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to talk about the Israeli minister who was refused access to COP26 today because she was in a wheelchair. Boris Johnson has apologised for it, but I wonder how widespread this is. If you are somebody who is disabled, not necessarily in a wheelchair, but do you, ha do you experience this sort of thing? One of our panellists, Kevin Shinkwin, we experienced it uh, an hour ago trying to get into this building. The lift wasn't working. How often does this happen? Has the situation improved since the passing of the Disability Discrimination Act 1995? That was supposed to have made this sort of thing not happen, has it? You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, Boris Johnson says the eyes of the world will remain on the COP26 climate change summit for the next 10 days. World leaders are now heading home from Glasgow, but high-level talks will continue between senior delegates. LBC's Westminster correspondent Ben Kentish has more. A high-level talk.